Well, welcome back to another episode of Johnny Trucking Outdoors. My name is John, and before we get into today's video, I want to say quickly, there is a video I put out about two weeks ago where I showed you guys how to enter in to win a GoPro Hero 9 and a $50 Bass Pro Shop gift card. If you guys haven't entered in that giveaway, I've had about 40, 50 in entries so far. But if you guys haven't entered into that giveaway, it's about the total value is around $400. So hop over a couple videos back, check out that video at the end. I'll tell you guys how you can win the GoPro Hero 9. So go ahead and enter in that giveaway. And I wish you guys the best. This next week on Friday the 24th, I'll be doing a live video on YouTube and giving away that GoPro Hero 9 and the $50 Bass Pro Shop gift card. But I was just at the Ultimate Fishing Show this last week. And I know this video is going to be a little bit different than the normal adventure I go out on and film. But Fish Frey was there, which is awesome because he's been fishing for years now and or decades and he has about 30.5 thousand subscribers here on youtube and he's a, a guy that i absolutely love watching and he catches steelhead and salmon and i videoed about a 25 minute video of him presenting how fishermen can catch more steelhead and more salmon here in michigan or wherever across the country you guys live so I hope this presentation and his seminar helps you guys to become better fishermen. Let's get right into it. All right guys, so um, I'm Davis and thank you guys for all coming out and I'm gonna give a super fast crash course on float fishing for steelhead. Um, it is really an extremely simple <coughs> method and in my opinion, it's the best <coughs> method if you're just getting into steelhead fishing. This is the easiest way to catch these fish in my opinion. So, um, what is it? It's nothing more complicated than bobber fishing. You know, a float is a bobber, it's the same thing. And you could do all these things with the same circle bobber that you probably use as a kid catching bluegill. All I'm gonna share with you guys is what we as steelheaders kind of tweak about this technique to really refine it as a super effective technique for steelhead. Um, in my opinion, it's just the most natural way to present the bait to these fish and it's your most likely chance if you're getting into the game. So uh, real quickly, uh, what are they? It's just a migratory rainbow trout. So um, we treat them like a stream trout, even though they spend most of their life uh, in Lake Michigan. So we're presenting our bait to these fish as if they were a trout. You know, they spend many months in the river and they feed like a trout. They eat bugs, they eat eggs, stuff like that. So float fishing allows you to get your bait to them in the most natural way and they don't even think twice about eating it if you do a good job of presenting it. So I'm gonna go through uh, as many things as I can in 20 minutes, but mainly what you need, uh, what you should get if you're just getting started. Um, and then presentation is very important. Uh, so that's, that's the technique. Um, so what you need, the technique, and then where and when, um, as much as you can uh, do to put yourself in the right place at the right time. And then I think mindset is really important, especially as you're getting started. It's also a mental game. So um, that being said, why am I up here? I'm definitely a stark contrast to Jim and you know some other people that are giving seminars because uh, I only caught my first deal hunt about nine years ago. Um, and then around six years ago, I started float fishing, which is what I'm talking about today. So. That being said, um, I've been sharing what I do over YouTube, which has helped me learn how to educate people. And I know I've helped a lot of people get started. And I also learned on my own. I didn't have a mentor per se. And I went through a lot of struggles that if you guys are just starting, you might be going through those struggles. Um, so yeah, so that's why I'm up here. And I was born and raised in Ohio fishing on Erie trips. We're focusing on Lake Michigan tributaries because that is the focus of uh, the Great Lakes Angler Diary, although they're also collecting data on uh, the Clayton River and Lake Huron. But that being said, I think the Ohio Erie tributaries are a whole different game. So I'm gonna focus this talk about Lake Michigan tributaries, uh, things that I think apply most there, even though there's lots of overlap. So I've spent six years in Michigan now, I've spent four years at Ferris, and now I'm in Grand Valley. So 
Uh, I'm just going to start right away with the rod um, because I think it's one of the most unusual things. If you're not familiar with this, I remember the first time I saw people with center pins. I mean, it looks like a telephone pole, right? This is a 13 footer, uh, which I say at the bottom here, this is my choice. And I actually use a 13 footer in small creeks even because I don't like re-rigging stuff. So I'll go from a big river to a small creek and I'll bushwhack with this thing. But there's a lot of reasons why we use a long rod. Mainly, you can keep your line off the water. So if my float is all the way over there in the corner with this 13 footer, I can have no line on the water. And what that does is that prevents drag, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but essentially you're getting the most natural drift. You're presenting your bait at the same speed as the current, which is what a trout is looking for. They're positioned with their head up in the current. They're looking for a perfect drift. And a long rod allows you to do that, especially on a big river. You have multiple different current speeds. And the main problem that a lot of times you'll face, you have faster current in front of you and the fish are sitting in the slow seam where they're more comfortable. So that's why we use these 13 footers or even 15 footers. Um, and that being said, I don't think the rod is a very important part of this whole process. I think any long rod will do, um, and especially a light rod, a, lot, a rod with a lot of flex because the other reason is it's protecting your leader. This is why we can use six pound tests or even sometimes lighter leaders for these huge fish. Um, it's because this will bend over. I mean, you could put a bend in this and put your rod tip back to basically the handle and every time a fish head shakes, the length is absorbing all that. So that's why um, I think the rod is, is very important um, in terms of length, but doesn't need to be sensitive, doesn't need to be a good rod um, at all. I prefer a medium wide or light action 13 footer for all around stuff, but anywhere, any longer than average rod will work. And if you're in a pinch, just use whatever rod you have and try your best. You know, I, I really don't think the rod is the key and neither is the reel. You don't need a center pin, which a lot of, when I first started, I saw these guys with these 13 footers and purple center pin reels with orange line and stuff I'd never seen before, but it, that doesn't, it's not necessary to get on the fish. You can use whatever reel you have, but there's pros and cons to each. So using a spinning reel is a great way to do it, but you have to do more work on your drift. Uh, what a center pin reel is doing is um, there's no drag. It's just a freely spinning spool. So the speed of the current will pull line off of this easily. Uh, with a spinning reel, you have more work to do. You're opening, closing your bail, and it's uh, a bit more of a chore, I would say. Um, and bait caster is the same way. You can click the button and let it run. Um, but Baitcaster has its own set of issues with ice uh, that spinning reels and center pins don't really have as much. But another advantage of a Baitcaster, which I think is huge, I've just got into using a Baitcaster more, is uh, your retrieve. Uh, a lot of times, float fishing, sometimes if you have the space, you can run your bobber to the point where you can hardly see it anymore. So a lot of your time fishing is spent retrieving. So a bait caster, you can retrieve, retrieve instantly. Center pin, there's no gears, so you're sitting there spinning. So there's some really good advantages to all these kinds of reels, essentially. And what I'm trying to say is you can use whatever you have if you're just starting. But I personally use center pin most of the time. It's kind of an optimized tool for float fishing once you get the hang of it. This is the rig, um, and these are the components of the rig that you'll need. And this is also a visual example you guys can see. You might have heard of a shot pattern if you've heard about float fishing. I really don't buy into that much. I really simply bulk the amount of shot that I need at my swivel. And if I need extra to balance my float, which I'll talk about later, I put it up with the float. And this is the business end right here. This is the only thing that the steelhead should see is simply your leader, your hook, and often I'll use small, very small shot on a leader to help get it all down. So I don't really get too worked up about shot pattern. I think if you're just getting started, um, I would rig up like this and I wouldn't worry about where your shot are on your main line. Uh, it's more of a specialized technique. You might hear about it in maybe Roger Hinchcliffe's seminar. I know he's talked and might be talking in some more advanced float fishing techniques, but after doing it for years, I usually do it this way. So my main point is don't get caught up in 
little details like that. Just focus on the business end that the fish are gonna see. Uh, starting from the top though, mainline I think gives people the most issues float fishing. It's really important to how you present your bait uh, because of what's happening on the river surface. That's where your float control comes in. That's the effectiveness of float fishing is getting that perfect drift. Um, so you really need something that floats. That's the first thing. And you need it to have low memory. So not a line that springs, it's gonna spring up, especially if you fish with a spinning reel or a bait caster. Um, so I throw Trilene XL smooth casting up there. I think that's what I recommend to people who are just starting and trying to save some money. Um, it has really low memory, it floats good, it works. It doesn't last as long as I like, but um, that's my recommendation if you're just getting started and you're trying to save money. I use Blood Run mainline, it's 23 pound. Um, so it's more suited to a center pin. Um, you would probably want to use lighter line on a spinning reel. The reason for that is it's bunched up much tighter on the spool. So um, braid kind of has all the awesome ingredients that you'd want for a perfect float fishing line, but it freezes and it gets water all over your reel. Um, and it also has no flex, which sometimes is an issue with these fish when they're head shaking. Um, so I almost always use some kind of floating mono. Bobbers, um, you'll see all kinds. You'll see custom bobbers with art on them. You'll see foam bobbers, circle bobbers, but mainly the style that most people are using is just this. It's a stem, a stem on either end that you use tubing to attach the bobber with. And there's a reason everyone uses it. It's super convenient to adjust your depth. Uh, it's very visible at long distance um, and People get like their favorite styles and shapes. I think this is like the standard that I would recommend everyone use. Most companies call this a fast and deep style or they'll rate their styles by current speed and depth, which I don't think is very intuitive at all or relevant, but um, use whatever one you like and just get used to it and learn to you know, control it. Um, some people think in small, clear water floats, floats will spook fish, but I, I use giant floats. I use 15, 18, 20 gram floats everywhere I fish because I'm usually filming when I do and it, I'm trying to get it on camera. So the bigger float, the more likely I am to get it on camera. Don't have any problems in small creeks. Um, if you're fishing somewhere that the float is going to spook the fish, it's probably not very good float fishing water, realistically. Um, but if, for this style, you need to have tubing and you need two pieces of tubing on your main line. Uh, you can use whatever 1 16th ounce or 1 16th inch tubing you can find. If you can find a cheaper way to do it, some people order it or get it from the hardware store. Um, but that's just what you need. Some people use slip floats and I would recommend that if you're fishing deep, big rivers because if you're pushing 10 or feet or you're pushing the length of your rod and you're fighting a fish, you can't reel past that bobber you're gonna have a really hard time landing your fish with that length leader, so a slip float will solve that problem. But generally we use fixed floats and tubing, and that's what I'd recommend. And kind of, I think the biggest takeaway for uh, just getting into this float fishing is don't give these fish any reason to not bite it. So that's why we use these little tiny swivels and we use tiny split shot. Um, use dull split shot because that's going to be near where the fish is and these fish have really good eyesight. So um, that's why I recommend, you know, purchasing those products instead of using, you know, whatever stuff you might already have if you're just getting into it. I think these things make a difference. And um, some days, especially if you fish clear water and um, the reason we don't use winged split shot usually is because it catches in the current and it affects your drift. Whereas you, you want a streamlined and invisible setup. That's the idea. Pretty much you're presenting a small bait and you're just putting it right in these fish's face. Don't give them any reason not to eat it. All they should see is the bait and they're in a position to eat. You're giving them the right bait. So try to eliminate tackle that um, <coughs> causes those problems and then balance your float. So most floats will have a gram a gram weight, it'll say on the float or it'll say when you buy them, that's how much split shot you need to balance the float to the point where 
it's flush with the water surface and if a fish pulls down it's not going to feel any resistance because all it takes it takes almost nothing to pull it under when you have that balance so that's why um, you want to know the weight of your split shot as well or whatever weight you use <clears throat> and it's just a simple math equation you just equal it out equal the weight to the float and that's your balance leader um, is really important because that's the business end and that's also the breaking point but that being said uh, we use a lot of really light lines and i would recommend you guys use light leader too if you're just getting started you learn the most from getting hookups if you're really struggling to get hookups um, a hookup and losing the fish is better it's more educational than not interacting with the fish and um, a lot of times we'll use six pound tests even that fish there is a 34 incher which is in the upper range of what we get here in michigan and that's six pound test battle you know five minutes and we get the fish in the net so that happens quite a bit and sometimes six pound test is the best choice your factors are going to be water clarity fishing pressure and what is around you if you're fishing in a wide open space you can get away with six pound or you know a light leader like that but if you're Drifting into a log jam, just sometimes where they are, um, run, you know, just you have a lot of factors to consider, but that's why I usually carry 6, 8, 10, and 12. And then if, if the bite's tough, I'm going to be running 6 almost all the time. But um, there's other situations which I'll talk about too. Um, and just check it frequently because if you catch a fish on it or you got snagged with it, um, that's your breaking <coughs> point and it does not take much. You get a knot in it these fish will break you off they are really big and they fight really hard so um not going to talk much about hooks i just use i use really small hooks smaller than you would think for fish of this size um, down to a size 12 for spawn bags and um, with beads you use a little bigger hooks um, and i think that roger Hinchcliffe is giving a bead talk after this so if you want to get into the weeds of bead fishing which I don't get into at all. You can probably figure out how to see that. But small hooks, um, wide gap, short shank, that's what we use for spawn bag fishing. And they, they stick really well in the fish's mouth. We don't lose a lot of fish to pulled hooks uh, using these style hooks. So that's the pretty much the breakdown of all the terminal components that you need. Um, it all fits in a little thing like this. So that's why I love float fishing. You can really run and gun. You don't even need a pack. Everything that I need, I carry in one of these little float wallets. Um, so it's part of the beauty of it. But then when it gets into baits, um, it becomes a little more complicated, especially if you want to run spawn. Um, that being said, if you're getting started and you can get a hold of good spawn, good eggs, it's just salmon or steelhead eggs. This is the best way to catch these fish and a float's the best way to present it. So um, if you can get your hands on good bait, it'll really it'll shorten your learning curve and it'll put you on the fish if they're there. Um, there's a reason that, that everyone's running it. Um, and it's really easy to cure it yourself. So uh, I have videos on my channel of how to do it. And you can also order it online or if you're trying to get into the game, Potsky Trout Eggs is the one commercial product that I have tried that I think is decent. It's not nearly as good as the real deal, but it comes in a jar and some place, I think Meyer sells it sometimes and then some places around here. So um, you can't get spawned, you're still in the game. Um, don't lose confidence just because you don't have the spawn. Um, beads, jigs, they will keep you in the game. And especially if you can get wax worms, these tube style jigs here, this is a Michigan classic. You'll find these on every single winter's deal at hole in the state. You'll find them in the trees and it's for a good reason. Uh, load them up with wax worms and fish them with confidence uh, or even uh, the marabou jigs are great without bait. So you can still be in the game uh, without bait. And this is the extent of what I use while float fishing. No, it's nothing more than that. I use spawn when I can and I usually carry two rods. I have one rigged with a jig and one rigged with spawn. And it's as simple as that. I don't. If I can't catch them on that, they're probably not active fish, so I'm probably not going to catch them. So I recommend focusing on just proven winners. You know, these are what everyone uses for a reason. And the presentation is important, even if you have good bait. Um, 
you're not going to be in the game if you're not presenting it right. So um, it's just important to think of these things as trout. They feed on items in the drift. They're sitting, they're facing with their head forward in the current, and they're just looking at what's in front of them, watching it drift by. And if it's food, they eat it. So um, you just want to you want to get it in front of their face, um, not too deep. So I usually start shallow, work my way till I start detecting bottom, and then I come up at least a whole foot um, because you only want them to see your bait. You don't want them to see all of your terminal tackle. So that's why um, this is caused by drag, which I talked about earlier. And um, it's when your bait's going slower than the current speed. And when that happens, uh, the fish is not gonna see your bait first. It's gonna see your terminal tackle. And it's also not natural to them. They're expecting to see things going the same speed as the current. So if you give them a presentation like the one on the far left, where it's kicked out in front a little bit, then they won't see it coming. All they see in front of their face is that small, perfect bait that they're used to eating in the wild. So they take it, that's, that's the goal of float fishing. Um, and then in slower water, you'll get a perfectly vertical presentation, uh, works well too, but usually the goal is to have your bait kicked out in front a little bit. And how you do that is you add a little tiny bit of tension as you drift. So um, yeah, that's, this is really important. And this is what I think a lot of people get tripped up on, but um, you want to find bottom. You pretty much know these fish are going to be within one or two feet of the bottom and get that good drift. And as long as you're doing that, you're definitely in the game for a bite. What makes a good float fishing spot? This is probably my most asked question. It's usually phrased as what river are you fishing in this video? <laughs> but it applies, these things apply to all rivers. And we have, we have opportunities and dozens of rivers. So um, the way I fish is I fish everywhere. I don't fish one river all the time. And I found that pretty much the same things apply. You need depth. You shouldn't really see the bottom realistically if you're float fishing um, 30 inches or deeper. I would say once you get into the eight, nine, 10 foot range, I would go as far as to say it's too deep sometimes and it's difficult to fish. So focusing on 30 inches to maybe six, seven, eight feet, those are gonna be the really good spots. And the really good spots are obvious. So this, this is where you should learn in my opinion. The bank will be completely beat. There'll be spawn magnetic on the bank. There'll be bobbers in the trees across the way. I recommend you guys learn to fish on those holes and then that'll help you guys dial in where these fish live and give you more experience with hooking up. So um, it's not always the bends. A lot of people fixate on the river bends, but there's really deep holes and straightaways uh, that you can find. Um, and the only way to find is to go out and fish. Uh, get snagged, unfortunately, that's how you find new holes. Um, these fish love living near the wood, so. Um, in Michigan, we have this awesome duality. You can do whatever you want. You can fish right down the road in urban areas, and you can fish along with other guys, and you can learn from other guys, which I would highly recommend. Uh, fish a popular dam. Um, there's a lot of great steelhead fishermen there that fish every day, and they're really open to teaching you guys how to fish if you're new to it. Um, if you run into someone who's not open to help you out, they totally have the wrong attitude, and that's on them. So sometimes you might want to fish in a more social setting. Usually there's more fish in those spots. They're more heavily stocked because they're close to population centers. Um, you can also go for complete solitude. This is a spot where I, I was the only tracks in the snow for miles and miles. Um, and I didn't catch any fish there, but I had a great experience. So that's the duality of Michigan and uh, part of why it's so awesome. And this is right behind the conference center, so I just thought that picture would be fun. <laughs> That's where we are, right, right behind. And then any time of year is good for float fishing. There's never a time where you might think, oh man, this isn't float fishing weather today. You can always go out and do it, um, but there's a few ways to tweak your presentation <coughs> that I think are important seasonally. Um, in the fall, uh, the fish are the most aggressive and they also fight the hardest. So you should beef up your leader in the fall and you should fish faster water. Um, 
that will really help you out and you will not regret beefing up your leader for those fish. They fight like nothing else. Uh, once winter comes around though, uh, the fish will settle into the deep holes. That's a great time to run light leader and hook fish. You're probably fishing for fish that have been caught for, or been caught several times. So my last trip, I caught a fish with two different hooks in its mouth, broken off. So by running six pound leader in good bait, those fish will bite again. Um, and that's what winners like, the fish aren't moving as much. So fish slow um, and also let your bait go way down in the tail outs. Uh, it's pretty well known that steelhead will move back into the shallow water of the tail outs to get access to like, more sun on their backs. So sometimes in the winter you actually want to shallow up and fish the tail outs if you're not getting anything in deep holes. Spring is awesome. The fish are everywhere. Uh, they're up there to spawn. So uh, you can also get away with fishing higher upstream areas then you'll find fish in the other months of the year. So spring's kind of upon us right now. Uh, this is that time of year uh, where the fish are starting to move up. And I also think it's important to say to let them spawn. As float fishermen, uh, your intentions are already probably good and that you're not gonna fish for actively spawning fish. But um, it's, it's usually not uh, a good idea and float fishing won't, won't work well. If you see fish actively spawning, Leave them alone, fish downstream of them. There'll be other fish feeding on their eggs. So, um, yeah. So I will kind of wrap this up with a talk about mindset. And I've tried to, to talk about this for salmon fishing in Michigan too. Uh, this is, it is not bluegill fishing. It's not about the action. You're going out and you can catch a fish that could make your week or your month. Um, so just, Go out with the expectation that you might not hook up or you might only get one chance. That's kind of the standard. And um, what we have what we have for that opportunity is a lot better than anywhere else, uh, pretty much outside of Alaska for these fish. So um, don't compare yourself to others. You'll hear people that say they hook 10 fish, 15 fish, 20 fish. Don't let that get to your head. Steelhead will give people a huge ego and um, that's, I think, a big problem is that people hear those kinds of ratios and they think they should be hooking up with that many fish too. But a really, really good fish day is one hookup, two hookups, three hookups, and then you get yourself there on the right day, you might have double digit hookups. But I just think it's a lot more rewarding if you go out and you get skunked and you learn things. And um, it's just important to know. Uh, it's all part of the game. I think float fishing is the best way to get on these fish and to get on them in numbers any time of the year, but it's not going to be every day. So I'd like to reiterate that if you are lucky enough to live here in the Great Lakes, this is a steelhide and a migratory fish paradise. We have the freedom, we have the public access to target these fish that a lot of people we be really jealous of. So just get out and enjoy it. Um, and then thanks to the DNR for giving us this opportunity and for Michigan Sea Grant for you know trying to gather this data with the Angler Diary and for having me out here today. So that's all I got. Well, I hope this info was extremely helpful and useful to you guys. As always, stay outdoors, stay amazing. I hope you guys entered into the giveaway, and I'll see you guys on the special video next week on the 24th. I'm gone.